Hey, I'm Steve Kranz for Guitar Gathering. Thanks for joining us on the second lesson on open chord voicings. These are these amazing uh, wide sounding <laughs> intervals that really make your uh, chord playing sound very different and exotic. So uh, there's a PDF that goes along with this lesson. You can uh, find that link in the YouTube description down below and that can get you all of the uh, uh, information that we're talking about. So uh, let me just kind of play a little bit of these for you. Let me crank up my... Uh, Crank up my reverb a little bit and uh, see if we can get you familiar with some of these uh, voicings here. open chord voicings there and a uh, very unique and rich sort of a sound there and they work great with uh, let's see if it gets a little bit of distortion here open chord. So this is part of it. This is the second part of a two-part lesson. So we've got the PDF. So let me just kind of review a little bit of what these things are. In this big world of ours, kids, we've got closed voicing uh, chords. A chord, remember, is made up of just three tones. Let's say a G is made up of a G, a B, and a D. <laughs> Now, I can, it doesn't matter what order they appear in, they could be a G, B, and a D, um, or a B, D, G, or D, G, B. Doesn't matter which order the, the I put the notes in. Remember our triad series? All of those are a G. Now, what those are closed voicings because the notes are, uh, all the notes in the chord or in the voicing are in within one octave. So if I open that up and make those intervals wider, instead of playing a, a G, B, and a D, I could maybe play a G, D, and a B, which is above the octave there. That's a wider interval there. That would be a open voicing. All of these would be open voicings because they're wider than a uh, an octave. Okay, so that's the difference between open and closed voicing. Let me double check my tuning here. Life's too short to have questionable tuning. There we go. There you go. All right, so that's the difference between open and closed voicings. Now, I gave you uh, it, there's a whole different bunch of permutations, but we talked about last time about like if I take a, a, oh, a form like this, a G, a D, and a B. Now, if I move each one of these in the key of G up to the next note in the scale, the G would go to an A, the D would go to an E, the B would go to a C. I end up with the minor shape. So G major, A minor. Then the next one would be a B minor. It's getting a little high, so I'm going to lower, lower this down an octave. Then a 
C major, D major, E minor, and then this kind of an F half diminished. Remember, diminished is a circle, half diminished is a circle with a slash through it. You can also think of it as a minor seventh flat five. And then we have the G. there. So that's if I did it in G. If I did it in C, it would be. So it depends. Uh, you're walking up the, the chords in the key, which we've talked about a bunch. The, 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 every chords in a key have a certain pattern. The one chord built off of the first step is major. The chord built off of the second, the third, and the sixth is minor. The chord built off of the four and the fifth is major. The chord built off of the seventh step, the scale, is this half diminished minor seven flat five thing. So this is just one particular voicing. The root, the fifth, and then the third way high up. Now what if I took this and just put it up the next string set? Same notes. So I'm going to play the G here, the D here, and the B here. So same notes, I'm just playing on different strings. This, were on the, this was on the fifth, the third, the fourth, and the second. Now it's on the first, or excuse me, the fourth, the third, and the first. Now, interestingly enough, it's the same finger pattern. First, third, pinky. It's the same finger pattern. So just as you're walking up the scale, it stays the same finger pattern all the way up. Even way up there into the stratosphere there. So the, that's one way you could do it. Hey, I could, I could even lower it an octave. What if I lowered an octave so the G became this G, the D became this D, the B became this. Okay, so this would be the, the uh, voicings that I've shown on page two. Now here, the shape is a little bit different because we're on a different set of strings. We're on the sixth, the fifth, and the... The third, so I'm really plucking with my first, or excuse me, my thumb, my index, and my ring finger. So you couldn't really do this if I had just a pick. That would be difficult to do. I mean, I guess I could. But it's gonna, I'm gonna end up getting some other notes in there as well. So it's easier for me to do it, either finger style or with kind of a hybrid picking where I'm using, if I did a hybrid picking, it'd be my thumb and index is holding the pick. But if I do the lower octave, a little bit of an odd shape there. So there you go. That's what the different, I, I wrote them out for you here on our handy dandy PDF there uh, on uh, the first page and the second and the third page there. Um, to, to help you out with that. So that's basically what that is. Now I don't necessarily want you to you know go memorize these these forms, but I want you to think about them. Think about what's happening here. It's not like those are the only ones. Those happen to have the the order of the notes is the G is the lowest tone, the root is the lowest tone, the fifth in the middle, and the third, whether major or minor, is up at the top. Okay? But I I do have some that are different different ways of doing that. So let's say I went to maybe the key of C. So take a look at the next page. This would be page three. And listen to all these different voicings and just how they sound on the instrument. Which is the same as this one. of these are a little bit different all the way up. I can even go below that. Just so, so you hear all of those were a C chord. But do you hear how they, it just sounds very, each one of them has a different characteristic, a different way of doing it, a different sound that goes along with it.
So instead of the next time you see a C and you're just gonna bang out a Okay, which is what every, every other guitar player on the planet's gonna do that. You have some options now. I can use inner voicings and triads and things like that, and I can come up with guitar parts that sound like this. I can do inner parts like that, but now I also have another option. I can do these larger voicings, which are great for swells and things like that. good for swells and, and all of that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's some, that's some differences between the different shapes. Now, I can, let's just look at this for a second. In this particular version, I've got the third as the lowest tone, the uh, middle note is the root, and then the highest note is the fifth. So if I continued on with that, I end up with some rather unusable shapes because they're just so big. But I do like this shape. That's a comfortable shape. Uh, you also could play some of these things, you know, voice a little bit different. I have a, what is that, an F, a D, and an A. I could voice that like this, which is probably a little bit easier to voice it. So I included some variations of these in there so you could see. And if I were serious about practicing this, just pick one that you like and work it all the way up and down the key, and that'll help you get familiar with some of these shapes. All right, so take a look at the, uh, the bottom of page three. What do we have there? All right, so this is common uh, chord progressions, chords that go together. Like in the key of C, we would expect to see a lot of Gs or G7s going to the key of going to a C, that's the five going to the one, the dominant going to the root. So is there a way to do that? Well, if I like this form for the root, then maybe I could use this form for the G, which has the B, the G, and the D, which would be a five to a one in the key of C. If I did that in the key of F, it's the same shape. I just move it down a string set. This would be a C chord, which is the five chord in the key of F. Going to the F. Again, look at the shape. It's the same shape. Here's another thought. Here's another thought, for, a bonus thought for you. A lot of these, not all of these on that line, but a lot of them include a common tone. That G, you're going to see in both chords. That fourth string G. Do you notice how that was in both chords? If I go to the next combination, this C is in both chords. That's what makes a chord sound... Um, a chord progression sound connected when you can connect these chord tones. That note's in both chords. Can you hear it? What if we did another combination? What if we did this combination? A G, an E, and a C, which is a C chord. Well, a common progression in that would be to like the one, the four, and then back to the one. Again, here's our common tone. That C is in both chords. Can you hear the can you hear the common tone? So all, you can hear how it automatically sounds like they go together. That's because we've got this common tone happening there. Well, if I wanted to do other types of progressions, I mean, if I wanted to do, let's say, I was in jazz and I wanted to do like a 2-5-1, well, the chords are for a 2-5-1 progression, which is something a chord progression you see a lot in jazz, that would be in the key of C, the 2 would be the D minor, the 5 would be the G, and then the uh, 1 would be the C chord. Well, I could do, that would be a D minor, and then look, the G is right underneath it, and then just move this whole picture down, same fingers and everything. So it's two, five, and then just move those fingers down. One, 
think now I can play them together. I have them notated down here together as if they if you're playing them together. But just realize you can offset these. Let's see it. Let's see uh If I went uh, the lower tone, the upper one, and then the middle. different variations by just doing some different picking so you you can get real creative it sounds melodic but it, it, it but it also it's not linear like you would normally be playing a scale it sounds different from that when I go different sound so experiment around with them it's just uh, it's a type of chord that that has a very unique sound Eric Johnson uses a lot of these these spread triads is uh, and you hear them all the time in his playing so there are some different chord uh, combinations for you let's flip over the page all right so now let's take a look at page four now let's go to the bonus round kids okay so if I have let me just get a little groove going here in C major. Two, chicka, three, chicka, four, chicka. Okay, so this is C major seventh. Now remember that concept that we did talk a while back about the super arpeggio, about how I can take the notes of one chord and superimpose it over the notes of another chord to get a more elaborate sound. One of the tricks we did in that was kind of this jumping of thirds. So this is a C major seventh. Um, the E minor seventh is another chord that I could superimpose over the C major. So if I did a C major, minor. What if I did the next one up a G major? I've got suddenly all kinds of weird, wild sounding things that I'm doing, and all I'm doing is superimposing these triads over the other. This is a concept that Larry Carlton made famous. Uh, he would take these triads, now he was dealing with kind of closed triads. We're dealing, we're now applying the same concept to a, uh, uh, an open triad situation. So think with me, it's over C major seventh. What, the, what are the notes in a C major seventh? A C, E, G, then a B natural, okay? If I kept going, C major ninth would be a D. Well, what notes are in a C major? C, E, G. What notes are in an E minor? E, B, G. What notes are in a G major? G, B, D. So all of those notes are in these triads. Which, which form I play. They all work. Ah, so now I get, you know, three or four for the price of one, okay? So over a major seventh chord, I can start doing these little tricks. Now, it's not as complicated as you would think. You can keep going forever with it, but basically it's only functional for about the first two or three rounds. So over a major seventh chord, you go up to its third and play the minor, E minor. 
uh, I can actually go up the, another third to the G and go back to major again. So you're flipping major and minor and major. Okay, now if I went to one more up past the G, I get to a B minor seventh, which you're starting to get some tones in there that are not necessarily gonna work over that C major seventh. Not necessarily a bad sound, but it's just a, a different sound. So you may you season those to taste when you're getting that for it. But you could at least go two rounds up. So over C major, I can play an E minor and a G major. Hey, we also had a resource, uh, the chord deck. Remember the jazz deck? These little deck of cards that showed these sorts of chord substitutions on it. Um, if you're interested, that's a really handy little resource that you can you can purchase as well for learning these kind of sort of chord substitutions. Hey, what if we did we did it with major seventh? Can we do it with minor seventh? Sure can. All right, so take a look at the last last little example there. I, what if we had an A minor? Okay, I've got an A minor. And over this, I'm going to superimpose, again, we're fl always flipping minor and major and minor and major. So we start out with minor this time, then we're going to do a C major, then we're going to do an E minor. So, so if I, let's say I have a, a little, uh, let me get my groove going here, and I'll do a little A minor groove. So let's do a little A minor groove. Two, three, four. I'm in a clearly in a in a, a Aeolian, okay. All I'm doing is playing a C scale, but I'm starting on an A. Okay, so that works. But another option is, is I can start playing around with these uh, options for these open triads. saying it's the end-all be-all but I'm just saying it's another option so I don't always have to go for a minor pentatonic scale or play an a minor like this that's nice and all I can do that that's fine sometimes you're gonna want to do that but I'm saying this is another option so when you hear these really large uh, um, types of intervals chances are that's what they're playing so I we didn't do a full you know three month dive into this but I just kind of wanted to show you a little bit of what these intervals could do and the sounds that you can get from them so I would encourage you if you're interested in learning these take a few of these forms and start to figure out how they're working try to apply them in different keys like learn this form for the major you know maybe this one for the minor and just start you know if you see a D minor where can I go here. Uh, if I said a D minor, I could do our little trick. F major, A minor, C major, D minor. 
Uh, let's see. If I start adding notes to these. All I did was take a step up of the highest note. There's the D minor, I added a G. There's the C, I added an F. What is next? The A minor, I could do maybe add the D. Oh, what's next, an F? Uh, that one's a little trickier, I'd have to add the B. D. And so you start messing around with that. Let's see, uh, uh, what if I went above and then below? So there's all kinds of fun little combinations you can do that. I didn't want to take you through a thousand different permutations of it, but I just wanted to introduce the main forms of them. So take a look at that, experiment uh, with them in your own soloing, in your own learning. Get this PDF. It's all free. Just download it and uh, learn all that you can. Hey, I'm Steve Krenz for Guitar Gathering. Thanks for joining us on this lesson. Check out the other one as well, and uh, we will see you guys next time.